Hello, I'm Aaron Gittler. And I'm Nipresh Tungel. We're here to introduce our new paper in Neuron entitled Parkinson's Disease Genes EIF4G1 and VPS35 Interact Genetically and Converge on Alpha-Synuclein. In this paper, we use several different experimental approaches to uncover unexpected functional connections between Parkinson's disease genes. Parkinson's disease is a relatively common neurodegenerative movement disorder. The disease is mostly sporadic, but about 10% of cases exhibit a familial pattern of inheritance, and these rarer cases have led to the identification of mutations in genes that can cause Parkinson's disease. Studying the functions of these familial Parkinson's disease genes have led to important insights into the cellular pathways that are affected in even the more common sporadic forms of the disease. A better understanding of the pathways that contribute to Parkinson's disease will hopefully lead to more effective therapeutic approaches. In our paper, we use the budding yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, genetic screening, and validation in animal models to study a new set of Parkinson's disease genes. Nipesh will now explain what he did. Two of the newer genes implicated in Parkinson's disease are EIF4G1 and VPS35. EIF4G1 encodes a translation initiation factor, and VPS35 is a component of the retromer complex, which is involved in protein sorting. The yeast homologue of VPS35 is also called VPS35, and EIF4G1 has two homologues in yeast called TIF4631 and TIF4632. These genes are non-essential, so they can be deleted without causing growth defects. I performed a screen to identify genes that I could delete in combination with either TIF4631 or VPS35 that would cause a growth defect. This type of a screen is called a synthetic lethal screen and is a powerful way to identify genes that function in similar cellular processes. I used an automated method to combine each of the 4,850 non-essential haploid deletions with either the VPS35 deletion or the TIF4631 deletion by mating. We then used automated image analysis software to compare the size of colonies in order to identify double mutants that grew worse when compared to either of the single mutants. I also performed experiments to test for other ways that VPS35 and TIF4631 might interact with each other. I upregulated one gene and then deleted the other and vice versa. These experiments revealed a really striking interaction between VPS35 and TIF4631. When I upregulated TIF4631 or the human EIF4G1 in wild type cells, there was no effect on growth. However, when I upregulated these genes in VPS35 mutant yeast cells, it was highly toxic. I could rescue this effect by adding back either the yeast or the human VPS35 protein. And if I added back a human VPS35 with a Parkinson's disease causing point mutation, it failed to rescue the defect. We next wanted to test if this genetic interaction between VPS35 and EIF4G1 that Nepesh had discovered in yeast worked in similar ways in the nervous system. We teamed up with Drs. Kong Shen and Lingbo Li in the Department of Biology at Stanford to test these genes in C. elegans. The Shen Laboratory uses the nematode C. elegans to study molecular mechanisms of synapse formation and maintenance. On the long axonal projections, synapses often form on a small stereotype region of the axon. For example, on the DA9 axon, synapses only form in the posterior segment of the dorsal axon. Synapse formation in this system is sensitive to VPS35 function. Therefore, VPS35 mutant worms provide a sensitized genetic background to test for potential interactions with EIF4G1. Synapses formed as expected in wild-type worms, in VPS35 mutant worms, and in worms that Lingbo had generated to upregulate human EIF4G1. However, when she upregulated EIF4G1 in VPS35 mutant worms, she saw defects in the positioning, size, and number of synapses. These results demonstrate that the genetic interaction between VPS35 and EIF4G1 that Nepesh had found in yeast worked in a similar way in the nervous system. Having established a connection between EIF4G1 and VPS35, I next wanted to see if either EIF4G1 or VPS35 could interact with another Parkinson's disease protein, alpha-synuclein. Returning to yeast, I expressed alpha-synuclein in yeast and found that it was more toxic in yeast cells in which VPS35 was deleted. We next tested the interaction between alpha-synuclein and VPS35 in mouse in collaboration with Dr. Eliezer Maslaya's laboratory at the University of California, San Diego. In a transgenic alpha-synuclein mouse model that their laboratory has developed, alpha-synuclein expression results in neurodegeneration. Upregulation of the wild-type human VPS35 
was able to rescue neuron loss and lowered the amount of alpha-synuclein that accumulated. Expression of mutant forms of human VPS35 increased neuron loss, as did shRNA knockdown of mouse VPS35. These results validate the earlier studies in yeast and C. elegans and point to VPS35 and potentially the retromer complex as targets to protect against alpha-synuclein accumulation in Parkinson's disease. In summary, in this paper, we used a combination of experiments in yeast, C. elegans, and mouse to provide evidence for functional connections between three genes implicated in Parkinson's disease. Our next step is to perform new experiments to learn more about the mechanisms by which these genes function and how mutations in them impact this function and contribute to disease. Dr. Gregory Petsko's laboratory has recently developed a chemical compound that can bind and stabilize the retromer complex, thereby increasing its function. Because our results showing upregulating VPS35 levels can protect against alpha-synuclein-induced neuron loss in mouse, it will be interesting to test if these types of retromer-stabilizing compounds would also be effective in models of Parkinson's disease.